Yes, it's my favourite time of the day. Absolutely, it's Talking Pints with Martin Townsend. Martin, welcome. It's to lovely to be here. The Thank program. you. Now, we will, of course, talk about your 18 years editing a Sunday newspaper, but I want to go back to the beginning. OK. Because I find this interesting. You came from a relatively humble background, but you're clearly bright. You pass your 11 plus, you go to a grammar school. Yes. The same grammar school that Michael Portello yes. of this parish <laughs> went to. Indeed. Do you think that the opportunity you had from a modest background to go to a grammar school was one of the key things that helped you get on? 100%. Absolutely, 100%, yeah. Because I was, was from a very humble background. I grew up on a council estate. My parents always wanted me to get on, but didn't push me in any one particular direction. Um, and I got the chance to go to a grammar school, and immediately I got there. You know, it, it, well, it was run like a, like a private school, like a public yeah. school. So yeah. we had house system, you know, we had played rugby. I wasn't a great rugby player, I have to say, or cricket particularly. But, of course, the teachers there, the masters, were absolutely exemplary. And I was very lucky at that school to have an, an English master who absolutely encouraged me to write, which is all I ever really wanted to do. I wasn't much cop at anything else, really, if I'm honest. Very important in life. Indeed. I think you're good at. <laughs> well, and he was, he was incredibly encouraging and incredibly co encouraging with my parents, and he pushed me in the direction of, you know, because I was having the usual career things as you do and in the 70s if you were good at writing or good at English you were immediately say immediately say to you, you need to be a social worker so it always, it always went the same way <laughs> but of course I had Mr Golland I'll, I'll give him a name check yeah. actually James Golland who was my English master and he was saying to my parents he has to write you have to get him to write and that's when the idea of going into journalism I think um, it's really interesting because I, mean, I, I don't know about you but I feel that the closure of hundreds of grammar schools all over the country has perhaps denied a lot of boys and girls from your background. Oh, absolutely. I mean, of course, Th Theresa May did talk about, didn't she, at one time, I think it was going to plan to uh, reopen... For about five open minutes. 500, yeah, for about five minutes. And, yeah. and I thought that was a fantastic... I mean, basically, they became the kind of gold standard in an area. And what happened in Harrow, where I was, is you had Harrow County Gr Grammar School and then you had other schools around, and they all kind of came up around it, really. Um, and it was just a remarkable thing. No, it's really interesting. Yeah. But off you go into the big wide world. Yes. And it's <laughs> music and journalism. Uh, yes. This is where Martin Townsend <laughs> finishes up. And I understand you can actually sing a bit as well. Well, I sang, I, I did. I sang uh, on one of Paul Young's singles, uh, which ironically was called I'm Only Fooling Myself. <laughs> which, which, I don't know that was, if ever that was a joke of my expense. I, su I suspect it was. But anyway, yeah, I, was, I happened to be interviewing him one, one afternoon. He said, I'm going into the studio, I'm making this record. Can you sing at all? I said, well, actually, I, yeah, I'm OK. I can sing a bit, I can hold a tune. So he got me in and I sang backing vocals on this. And you can hear me. Just about just on this record, no, it's pretty cool. and it went on, and, and that was on his greatest hits, and it, and it won. Uh, I, I, I am entitled to a gold record. I've never claimed it from. Good Lord, but yeah, I could have a gold record on my wall. I don't think that's just quite nice. Good. Yeah. Now that whole world of music journalism. This is pre the internet. Yes. There were all sorts of newspapers, magazines. It's a very active, a very competitive world, wasn't it? Yeah, it absolutely was. We had the New Musical Express, the Melody Maker, Record Mirror, which I w worked for briefly. That's where I met Paulie Yates um, yep. uh, for the first time. Um, and it was, it was, it was extraordinarily, it was a great time for publishing all round at that time. I mean, you know, there were magazines about everything, but yeah, the music, the music press was incredible, really. And I worked at, at that time, the, my big breakthrough really was working for a thing called Number One magazine, which was IPZ, IPC's answer to Smash Hits. And of course, Smash Hits was the big pop magazine, the yeah. one that had Neil Tennant from the Pet Shop Boys working for it. But we were weekly, they were fortnightly. And we kind of gradually sort of started to catch up with them and sort of get our own relationships with people at the time, like Duran Duran and Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And I got to meet all these I mean, people. These big <laughs> 80s names. And 80s music was kind of upbeat and optimistic, wasn't it? It was. And, the, and you know, they wore brightly coloured Anthony Price suits. They made incredibly expensive videos. I mean, one of the reasons for that, actually, was, of course the arrival of the CD, because it meant that the record companies could sell all the same music to people all over again on CD. People would chuck away their, at, at that time, chuck away their vinyl. And vinyl's back now. Vinyl's <laughs> back now. And, of course, they were making money all over again. So that was why there was so much now, money. quite logically, you went 
a bit deeper into this. And it, mm. was, it was showbiz, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I did, I did showbiz um, for... Well, I joined Today newspaper with Eddie Shaw. Yeah. I was pop editor over there, but also doing a bit of showbiz. And I left there after about 18 months, two years, and went freelance and did showbiz for most of the national newspapers, yeah. Really enjoyed it. And showbiz pop. And we're now talking about the world of the Beckhams. Yes. <laughs> all these big people. And Paulie Yates will come back to yeah. in a moment. But of all those big stars that you met and interviewed, mm. and who did you really like? Who did you really dislike? Well, I liked... I'm just going to sound awful, but I liked most of them, actually. There wasn't very, very, very many people I fell out with. Um, the first ever interview I did was with a, a guy called George Benson, who had always been... A, I'd always been a huge fan of George. And we did this... We had this amazing interview, and he was drinking... We were drinking these vodka screwdrivers. <laughs> it was getting to be a better and better interview. And he was such great company, and he's such a great artist as well, and it was just such a pleasure to meet him. So I, I will always remember that one, because that yeah. was the first big interview I did. I think over the years, the ones... The one that I enjoyed the most, probably, looking back on it, was Roy Orbison, because it was such a, again, a privilege to meet him. And he said such interesting things about his music, about the dreamlike quality of his music, which really appealed to me, and I just thought he was an extraordinary man. Now, the relationship with the very troubled, I mean, the end, very tragic, mm. Paulie Yates, actually was the subject quite, well, not that long ago... Yes. ..of a big Channel 4 documentary, which you were very much at the helm of. Mm. Um, it's a long time since she died, and yet the interest in her still appears to be there. Yeah, and I was really surprised by that, if I'm honest, because when she died, which I think was in 2000, she seemed to be forgotten really quickly. And I was quite upset about that. I thought, Paula's gone, you know. I mean, I was very close to her. I was friends with her, and, you know, I missed her because she was a... <laughs> it was just great fun to be around. Yeah. But somehow the world had moved on and nobody seemed to want to know about Paula. And funnily enough, a couple of years ago, I actually suggested to someone, do a, why don't we do something on Paula Yates? And they said, oh, no, one, no, one, no one's interested. In fact, when that production company came along and suggested it, I said, well, I've got these tapes, you know, some of the last interviews she did, all of the last interviews she did, to be fair. Um, She's saying some extraordinarily, mm. extraordinarily interesting things on there, really emotional things on there about where she is in her life and the way she's been persecuted by the media and all of this sort of stuff, which oftentimes can be a bit dull. Everyone <coughs> claims to be persecuted by the media, but actually Paula probably did have a bit of a case mm. for that. And they, what they did was they separated Paula out from the kind of Bob Geldof dramas and they gave Paula back her personality and her character as a person in TV here mm. who was really important to There's Channel 4 and everybody. Very interesting project. Yeah. But you do all of this stuff, OK Magazine, and you know, <laughs> you're now working for Richard Desmond, and suddenly there's a complete 180. Mm. And Martin Townsend becomes the editor of the Sunday Express. Yes. And he's now doing serious stuff. Yes, yeah. Which was a shock to everybody. <laughs> uh, you know, and, 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 and I was getting a lot of uh, flack for that. Cause people said, well, you know, he's a showbiz Edit, yeah. a showbiz. But, you know, lots of people came from that side of things. Piers Morgan came from that side of things. I remember Piers saying something really interesting about editing a newspaper, and it was something along the lines of it takes you about five years to actually learn to do it properly. I think he said five years. Mm. I don't, I'd hate to misquote Mr Morgan. Okay. Um, but it did take me two or three years, at least, to really get into the swing of it. Well, you lasted 18 years. And I lasted 18 years. And so. you were a stable for young journalists that worked for you, Martin, that went on to become political editors of the Sunday Times, and it was Camilla Tomney who's yes. with us on Sunday mornings here. And all of that's quite rewarding. But I was with you at a, quite a big moment in the Express newspaper's <laughs> history. I was having <laughs> an extended lunch with Richard Desmond. <laughs> and, uh, yes. and I think you knew roughly where this was going, didn't you? I and did. I Desmond did. called you in. I was in the room. Hugh Whitto was editing the Daily... And Richard says, right, that's it. We've made our minds up. This newspaper group is going to back leaving yeah. the European Union. We're going to support Nigel. I, mean, I was astonished. Uh, that at the time, I mean, the rest of Fleet Street thought, thought the Express had gone mad. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a strange moment for me because I had... Put, I had <laughs> you had your reservations. I did, I did have... I can I, see it in your face. I did have reservations, <laughs> and the reason was that I knew the, read, the readers were conservative voters. Yeah. But I also knew that I'd never, ever had a single letter that was positive about the EU. Not one. Not one. <laughs> and also, I also knew that if I ever put the EU on the front of the paper about EU waste or something, all those kind of stories, yeah. my sale would go down. 
really, you know, it would just, it'd just plummet. And the reason for that I found out from talking to the readers was they didn't feel there was ever any hope of leaving the EU. Yeah. And if you present readers with a story that offers them no hope, yeah. no hope at all, yeah. they switch off. And so I stopped doing it. I stopped doing these EU... You know, but the moment there was a sniff of Brexit, the moment there was a sniff of um, um, we might be able to get and out they of could Europe, be enjoined in battle. Suddenly, you put Brexit on the front of the paper, and the sales yeah. went up. Yeah, well, you put me on the front a few I'll times. I put you on the front <laughs> yeah. quite a few times. Yeah, and it was it was an extraordinary thing. Well, it turned out that just as the Express was the only newspaper that really understood the threat that Hitler posed in the 1930s. Yes. The Express were the first on this as well. What well, amazing career, 18 years. I mean, Richard Desmond, how did you cope with him? Because he really, I mean, he speaks his mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he, he was, he's larger than life. He was always larger than life. I learned a lot from him. And I know, I know people say, he was ruthless. He could be ruthless. He could be very difficult, like a lot of successful people. Mm. But I... He was a very exciting person to be around because he achieved an awful lot and it was, it was great <coughs> to be around that kind of energy. Um, and I learnt a lot from his energy. I learnt a lot from his ability to, to want to have something done and to get it done quickly. So, you know, I mean, because it was all immediate. If he wanted something done, it had to be done tomorrow. Yeah, 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 and it yeah, got yeah. me into that discipline and I learnt an awful lot, actually, about him, about the technical side of putting... of what sells magazines, what sells newspapers. Just an extraordinary bloke. Yeah. And now you've left that big, you're at Pagefield, PR consultants. Yeah. Life must be a little bit more sedate now. Kind of. I've just had a weekend. I've, I've got to say this. I've just had a weekend that's been extraordinary because Bart's Hospital, which is one of our clients, celebrated its 900th yeah. birthday yeah. on Saturday. It was absolutely fantastic. They're building a brand new breast cancer centre, brand new clinical research facility with the help of Bart's charity, who collect the money from donors and, and, and make sure that these big projects mm. can happen. Because obviously the NHS can't afford to do this stuff. It has to be something that's done through yeah. donations, which has always been the way with Bart's as well. They had a long history of being supported. You can go into the Great Hall there and see all the donations. Yeah, I, on unbelievable. The it's an amazing place. So to, for me, it's been just a fantastic weekend. Pagefield is a great place to work. I really enjoy it. I've had a lot of fun. Well, I've, enjoyed I've now got a new career. So You've enjoyed yourself with everything you've done. I have. Including, I hope, <laughs> coming on Talking Pints. Really enjoyed it. Splendid. Martin, Thanks, thank Nigel. You. Thank you very much.